You've done the field work, you've collected your data, and you finished analysis. Now what? You can't really call it archaeology until you've actually disseminated your research. Hi, my name is Noel Hidalgo Tan. I'm the Senior Specialist in Archaeology at the CMEO Regional Center for Archaeology and Fine Arts in Bangkok. And today I'm going to talk to you about sharing your research, particularly uh, writing in academic journals. Uh, and if you stay into the end, I will share with you my top five tips on writing uh, productively and effectively. So archaeology is called the study of the past, but the proof of this study is done by writing and sharing your research. And to that extent, uh, all archaeologists and all researchers have a responsibility to share their research. Today, there are two broad ways that research is spread. Uh, which is the formal publication route and the informal word of mouth route. Um, the formal publication route involves writing of some sort, a permanent record. It could be an academic journal, it could be a report by your department, or it could be a longer form project such as a thesis or a book. The informal route is generally more impermanent and focuses on word of mouth. And here we're talking about uh, presentations in academic conferences, interviews, social media outlets, both of these channels are important, but if you have to choose one, the formal way is the better one and most preferable because it is more permanent. And for this reason, uh, in this presentation, I am going to focus uh, mainly about talking in uh, writing for academic journals. Uh, before I go on, I should say a little bit about myself. As I said, uh, I work at the CMEO Regional Center for Archaeology and Fine Arts in Bangkok. We are part of the Southeast Asian Ministers of Education organization, and I belong to an intergovernment organization in Southeast Asia dedicated to the promotion of uh, archaeology and fine art. I am an archaeologist by training. I have written a number of academic journals and book chapters in archaeology. And as part of my work, I am the editor of the SPAFA journal, a peer-reviewed open access journal run by the center. I also run a resource website about the archaeology of Southeast Asia. Uh, so southeastasianarchaeology.com, the spafajournal.com, and if you want to find out, um, if you want to find out more about uh, CMEO Spafa, uh, the website's here. Um, I have a following on Facebook, on Twitter, and Instagram as well. So let's talk about uh, the publication process. And like this, uh, like I said at the start of the video, I'm going to focus more on uh, journals. You've done the field work, you've completed analysis, uh, and in most cases, you want to be publishing your research somewhere. So uh, in most cases, you publish your research in a journal. But what is a journal? A journal is a scholarly publication focusing on a particular topic that is uh, published regularly. Journals are some sort of uh, record of the latest academic research. So when you read about in the news, researchers have announced a new discovery, it usually means it's been announced in a journal. Uh, journals, especially the good ones, have uh, some sort of peer review process. Usually um, usually a journal article is looked by other reviewers to check the quality of the research, and once it passes, the reviewers can publish. So some of the journals that are related to Southeast Asia uh, are found here. Uh, and also on uh, this website where I put a, a link up here. You should also be aware that not all journals are equal. Some journals have little or no quality control or just bad. Um, so for more information, I've had a link up there in the website and it will, be, it link, it will also be in the resource material that uh, accompanying this uh, lecture. But you can find out more information about journals that publish about Southeast Asian archaeology and how to tell about, uh, how to tell between Good journal from bad one. Now, now that we covered journals, let's talk about the research papers themselves. And here I use research papers to mean all kinds of academic and scholarly work, including journal articles, reports, thesis. So in this presentation, when I talk about 
uh, scholarly works, journal articles, research papers, I, I use them interchangeably. A good research paper has uh, at least one or one oftentimes more or more than one of these authors. Um, they often describe a new phenomenon. They describe a new theory uh, with new data. Or they disprove a new theory with uh, a current theory with new data. They can confirm an old observation and new context. And they can also be an extensive review of uh, previous. And I'll show some examples of these uh, with actual research papers. So the first one, describing a new phenomenon, is probably the easiest and most common article in archaeology. Most archaeology uh, papers are describing something new. A new dates, a new site, a new discovery. A new information is a key point, and papers like these tend to be descriptive. So this picture here is from uh, Angkor Wat, and the new discovery here is from this paper in uh, 2013, describing the LIDAR data from uh, Angkor Wat. They scan the landscape of CMB with LIDAR, which is uh, using light pulses, and using which they can discover new features in the landscape that were not detected before. So as you can see, like even in Angkor Wat, you have these um, this labyrinthine uh, shapes here that were not discovered before. And within the, the temple complex, you can see the presence of uh, roads and uh, mounds, which are probably the remains of houses. This image is also from Angkor Wat and is from one of my own papers. Uh, it's about a discovery of paintings in Angkor Wat. So in Angkor Wat itself, you have uh, these walls and you have these faint images of paintings, uh, which you can't really see. And so I discovered them. Well, I reported about them. They were not really discovered. Right? They were known in uh, they were known by locals, but I was able to bring out more detail than before. And so I'm describing new, new phenomenon where I uh, was able to uncover these details from these paintings that uh, cannot be seen with the, with the naked eye. So that's, that's new discoveries, very straightforward. Another, another technique, um, another paper that's common is confirming an old observation. In new so you have to show, uh, again, something that's new, a new context. Um, you have to add some insights into your, uh, you have to add some insight to your new observation. And altogether, this adds weight to a current hypothesis. Uh, such as this paper, which is about the Dongson drum in Timor, uh, which was discovered in East Timor. So it's a new discovery. It's a drum that was in East Timor, first time that's ever found in East Timor. But it also adds to a whole uh, corpus of what we know about uh, Dongsan style bronze drums on throughout Eastern Indonesia. So it adds weight to a current understanding of yes, there were uh, drums found all across uh, the Eastern Indian Islands. And uh, this in, this discovery in East Timor adds to this idea that um, there was a, a vivid trade in drums in um, another example is from Lao, and this is an excavation from Site 52 in the Plain of Jaws. Now, um, the Plain of Jaws is well known. It's now a UNESCO World Heritage Site. Uh, and Site 52, of course, is, is known because it has a number. Uh, what's new in this site is that um, there were new jar sites found in this area. People have been able to go in um, and, and look closely at the area and discover new sites in Site 52. So they're not new that in the sense that we we already know that there are jar sites, but we they're new in the sense that uh, we know where they are now and they've increased our knowledge of where the jar sites exist in uh in uh, the third type is uh quite exciting but also can be quite uh contradictory because uh quite controversial because uh you're contra you're contradicting an established theory. So by nature, it's uh, very controversial, which is not necessarily a bad thing by itself. Now, these articles promote a lot of debate because they require a lot of proof. But when they are successful, they expand our area of knowledge. Before we used to know this, and now we know something else, uh, which is why papers like these are very useful and also published because they uh, add 
or they increase our knowledge about uh, you. One example is with the rock art date from Indonesia before uh, before 2014, 2012. Uh, before 2014, all those dates were from France around 40,000 years ago. And uh, we used to think of France and Europe as the birthplace of art. It was where the oldest part, uh, rock art was discovered. But in the last decade, we've discovered uh, a lot of rock art in Indonesia that is just at all and, and currently even older. The oldest rock art sites in Indonesia uh, and in the region is about 45,000 years old, which doesn't, uh, which means that rock art uh, or art didn't start in Europe. Uh, in fact, it, it means that it started uh, simultaneously across the world, different places at different times. And this 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 proves this theory that oh, all art originated from some place across the world. Now now we know that uh, art, the idea of art, the idea of creating pictures, um, appeared simultaneously in different areas around the world. Another example from Indonesia is the discovery of Homo floresiensis or the Hobbit. Uh, before we used to think that the only hominin species in Southeast Asia was Homo erectus and um, some large extinct species in Vietnam. Uh, and then in the last 20 years, we've been finding more and more extinct species of uh, hominins, first in forests, and then more recently in the Philippines. Uh, and they've since died out, but they've, they've, um, they've added to the idea that there were many different hominin species uh, in the world and in Southeast Asia. Uh, and, and Homo sapiens, the ones that we believe do, are the ones that just just so happen to survive. The last type of paper is the review paper, which does what it says in the box. It is a review to update the current state of knowledge uh, by summarizing the existing data and discuss the implication. Uh, and this is quite useful for uh, as a first paper. If you if you are working on a thesis or if you're working on a yeah, if you're working on a thesis, your master thesis, uh, one of the essential things that you will have to be doing is you have to be writing a literature review. You should be considering uh, converting your literature, literature review chapter into a review paper. So this is what I did for my PhD. I wrote a when I was a PhD student, I wrote a uh, an article describing the state of rock art research in Southeast Asia. Uh, and and back then it was uh, it's been quite widely cited. Um, I managed to synthesize uh, before. A lot of the rock art research that was in the region, um, which was quite useful. But uh, because I wrote it in 2014, it is already out of date, that's eight years ago. Um, as you can see here in the Philippines, you might see that I've only marked maybe three or four sites uh, in the Philippines. Uh, this more recent paper that was published in uh, 2021, with an update to the sites in uh, the Philippines. And uh, now there are 19 sites in just the Philippines. Uh, and there are many more new discoveries in, in uh, Southeast Asia. So the problem with review papers is that they go out of date very far. Uh, most research papers and reports follow roughly the same format and structure. First, you have an abstract of about 100 and 200 words, which is a summary of the entire paper. Uh, most of the time, people just read the abstract to decide whether they should read the entire paper or not. So it's a very important element of the paper. Then you have an introduction that does what it says. It introduces the topic and the research and explains why the, the thing being researched is interesting and relevant, and also outlines the research question and opposite. Then you have a literature review that shows the reader that you've done your own research and that you're knowledgeable about what's being researched about. And you can talk about relevant issues and problems which support your, your uh, own hypothesis and the own your Then you talk about the research actions, which is basically what you did, what you discovered, uh, how you got your findings, and your conclusions talk about what uh, well, whether your research question was answered or your new insights from your research. And finally, you have uh, your, your references, which tell the reader all the or where you can find all the documents with it. This is the basic structure for most research papers, and it should serve you well for most cases where you are talking about uh, something that you found in the field. 
Once you've written your paper, you submit it to a journal and then it gets reviewed. Peer review is a form of quality control done by uh, other experts in the field to assess the quality of your, of your research. Uh, it's also very rare uh, that a paper is accepted for publication almost immediately. As an editor, I can tell you that most papers uh, either uh, either get rejected or they get asked uh, for revision. And you should expect this too as a, as a scholar yourself. You're never going to get immediate acceptance uh, all the time. Uh, uh, immediate acceptance is very rare, not unheard of. Uh, in most cases, your, your reviewers recommend that you make some changes or add some references or uh, examine a line of thinking that you have not considered before. So uh, why, why do some papers get rejected? As a general editor, I can give you some of the main reasons that papers have been rejected in the order of most serious, the least serious. Uh, the most serious ones up on the top, the least serious ones on the bottom. So the, the most serious grounds for rejecting a paper are on ethical violations, such as um, fabricating data, not having permissions, uh, or plagiarism. Sometimes these uh, these these are considered very very serious issues in uh, in, in ethics, uh, and sometimes they may not be discovered until the paper is published. But even if a paper has been published, something has been found out, uh, a serious ethical violation has been found out, um, the paper can be retracted, and it might even cost you your job. So, uh, in in all cases, you should never ever consider. Uh, plagiarizing or fabricating data. Another reason that papers are rejected is that the, the argument is bad, or the paper is uh, uh, the argument is poorly made, or the paper is based on inaccurate or out of date information. Um, and that's why it's very important to have a very good literature review because if we're only reviewing information that was published thirty years ago and ignoring all the information that was published in the last thirty years. Uh, you're going to be out of date, and your subsequently your information is also going to be out of date. Uh, less serious reasons for for being rejected is sometimes the paper is not in the journal. And I've I've received this a few times. Editor, I get submissions to my journal where it doesn't. Uh, I edit a journal on the archaeology and culture of Southeast Asia. If I get a paper talking about European archaeology, I'm going to reject it in the as far as scope. So make sure that you are submitting to a journal that is the scope of your paper. Um, another reason for rejection, nothing new has been added. If you've not, uh, you've not substantially um, uh, increased our field of knowledge. So remember what I talked about, elements of a good paper in my previous slides. You should always be adding new information. Um, if they're not adding any new information, then it's not worth publishing. Uh, lastly, the the last two the last two are, are least serious, but they, they can cause problems too. Number one, not following the format. Uh, and in my cases, um, in my case, not following the format means not providing uh, um, citation information for images, which is for copyright clearances. And so I can't publish a paper if I don't have that copyright clearance for them. So I have to reject a paper. Uh, and the last one is language. So I have to say that uh, most reviewers and most editors are, are quite forgiving when it comes to minor grammatical mistakes or typing mistakes. Where language becomes a problem is when the paper is not comprehensible um, to the reader. And so it's, it's important for you as an author to, to, uh, have other people look at your work before you submit it. Make sure that it's understandable. It's again, I should remind you that rejections are fairly common and you should not be discouraged if your paper is rejected. Uh, most of the time, reviewers leave very helpful comments to help you improve your paper for the future. And even when the outcome is ne negative, the review comments are almost always going to be helpful for you. Um, so finally, let me get to my, my top five tips for helping you write. Um, and um, especially for writing for a journal, these tips are applicable for 
writing in scholarly publications, writing in journals, but also helping helping you to write uh, in general. These are all um, uh, these are all tips that I use myself. They help me to get started on writing, which is important. Um, and they're not meant to be used together. You should pick one or two of these exercises, these tips, and and uh, work on them. So pick and choose the ones that work well for you. The first tip I have is with index cards. This is a very old school technique, uh, and you use something that's called index cards, so little little white uh, little blank cards. Um, using these cards to help you with your research, uh, it's actually a formal method. And uh, the method is this web, uh, web link over here. Uh, it forces you to organize your, your ideas and your sources before you write. So you, what you do with these cards is every card, you have one idea and one source. You write down the idea and you put down the source there so you can always reference it. Then. And then you, you uh, for every idea that you have, for every, um, every source that you have, you put it on a card. Uh, and then you end up with a stack of cards that, that you uh, that you you can organize. And then what you do is you lay them out on the table, and then you organize them uh, visually into the best flow of ideas. So what you have is a, a flow of ideas that you can lay out. So this idea connects to this idea, connects to this idea, connects to this idea, da da da. Uh, and in this way, the paper almost writes itself because then you can see. It's almost like this sentence, correct? This sentence, or this sentence, uh, and you end up writing your paper very fast because you have all your ideas organized together. That's one way. Uh, another way to think about writing is to use the storytelling approach, and this is uh, especially good when you're talking about a new discovery, which is common in archaeology. Uh, as you can see here, uh, these are all movies on Pixar. Uh, they are. One of the reasons that they are so successful is because they tell good stories. And, and one of the, the storytelling use, the, uh, tools they use is something called the story spy. Now, what is the story spy? It's a very simple, uh, it's a very simple structure because it supports, um, the weight of the, of the story. It goes, once upon a time, there was this, every day, this, and one day, this. Because of that, this happened, and because of that, this happened, until finally, this, ever since that day, this. Now, if you think about all the good stories that you know, all the good movies that you know, especially the Pixar ones, they all follow this structure. It's a natural way to tell a story because it helps the reader get from uh, here to here uh, very logically. And so you can apply this to a research story, to a research a research article. Uh, at first, we believe this. This is where you talk about your literature review. And then we did this. This is where you talk about your methods. Uh, as a result, we found out this. This is your findings. And now we believe this, your conclusions, your implications. So this structure is very useful for academic writing because it helps the reader understand the implication of new information in the light of old, old information. And, and this, this works for uh, telling a new uh, discovery, uh, presenting new information in an old context, and also uh, presenting uh, new data that, that contradicts old data. This fits this story. What I find as an editor is that um, many people just focus too much on steps two and three. First, we did this, and then we found this, but not too much steps one and two. And and the thing is, if you leave out your literature review or you don't do enough literature review, uh, uh, that's, that's enough for people to reject your paper. And, and if you don't do enough uh, analysis and your conclusions, that's also another reason why people start rejecting. So I find that, I find that the majority of the, of the weaknesses is there. Not enough literature review, not enough, uh, uh evaluation and application. My third tip for writing is something that I learned from Professor John Creekborn, the University of Florida. Sometimes when you write, you are doing many things at the same time. You are creating new content, you are rewriting, you're checking grammar, you're checking to see if your ideas flow, you're checking to see whether your, your, your sentences flow from one to the next and you're rereading your work. So 
uh, this method that John taught me uh, says that when you write, you choose to be uh, one of four people. You are the, the madman, architect, carpenter, or judge. Most, most importantly for this method is that you can only choose to be one person. So you, you should do it from left to right. First, you start as a madman. You just, uh, as, as it says, you just be a crazy person. You just write whatever's in your mind. Don't focus on grammar. Don't focus on anything. Just write whatever's in your head. You've done all the readings, uh, and you're just doing free writing. Just, just writing whatever you have in your head, putting it down into what? Uh, until there's no more, uh, until there's nothing left in your head. That's the madman. Then you become the architect. The architect takes care of structure. Uh, you look at the sentences and paragraph and see whether they flow from one to the next. Start moving sentences around so that they make more sense. Uh, and here you're building the, the, the building the house. Next, it will become the carpenter. And that, uh, that takes care of the spelling mistakes and the grammatical errors. And finally, you become the judge. That's when you sit back. You look at what you've written and then you evaluate. Is it, is it good? Is it bad? What's missing? Uh, is there a, is there an argument that's missing? Is, uh, is the argument valid? Is there some missing research? And then you start all over again. That's how, uh, that's how you get started on writing and that's how you just continue writing. And so, and so it compartmentalizes your, your writing actions in very four distinct, uh, areas. Um, my fourth tip is a really simple one, but also a very effective one, especially if English is not your first language. Uh, one of the basic tips for good writing is to write the way you talk, because talking sounds more natural than writing. And in fact, um, um, as you might know, the way you write in English and the way you speak uh, can be quite different. And one of the easiest, uh, one of the easiest ways to write quickly, I found, is to just uh, talk to yourself, uh, talk, um, talk about your thesis to yourself, explain your thesis to yourself, explain your research paper to yourself, and to record yourself. So I've, I've, I've done this a lot. I, I just talk to my phone, record myself on my phone, and, and I end up writing more than I, uh, end up writing because when you speak, it's actually quite natural. And you end up, uh, uh, writing automatically because you're already just saying it. You're just transcribing what you uh, And my final tip is to set targets, uh, set writing targets for yourself. Uh, writing has often been described as a muscle that you need to work out. It is a skill that gets better over time. So, you know, no one, no one uh, starts out by writing, you know, 1,000 words per day. They actually have to start uh, uh, growing to that state. So when I was writing my thesis, I started with a target of writing 100 words per day, really small. Uh, not necessarily quality words, but just at least 100 words. Right? If I if I didn't do my 100 words per day, not, um, I could not have my relaxation time. I could not go to sleep. I just have to do 100 words per day. And then after a week, I raised it to 200, 300, and I got to like, uh, 500 regularly. And after two months of, of, of doing this and increasing this, I was doing something like 2,000 to 3,000 words per day. It's, uh, uh, really fast. Imagine that uh, a paper is around, around three, around, um, six, 10,000 words. So I, I could be finishing an entire research paper in a matter of five days, uh, when I was writing 3,000 words per day. So a really important technique is to you start with a realistic number. So you even start with like zero, start with 50, 50 words a day, and then work your way up. It doesn't have to be quality words, but you do have to, you do have to continue edit and you have to uh, continue rising your number count every, uh, every few days or so. It, this works really, really well with uh, tip number three in, in your madman phase. So it's a madman, just, just, do your 50 words per day or 100 words a day and try to aim for at least 500 words a day. Um, uh, I think the best writers aim for writing at least 500 words a day and then on a good day, they can go more. But then uh, uh, work your way to a stage 
write at least 500 words a day. 500 words a day is not that long. It is the size of a, a blog post or a news article. So it's, it's not objectively uh, long to write. And as long as you can just uh, keep churning out words for enough time, you will get there. Um, so today we've talked about academic journals and what, what they are and why it's important to share your research. We talked about what makes a good research paper. I would like applying the four types of uh, research papers, new discoveries, disproving old theories, reinforcing new theory, or uh, reinforcing old theories, and the review paper. I talked about uh, some of the reasons why papers get rejected, and I gave you uh, uh, five tips for better writing, uh, which hopefully can help you uh, in your writing journey. Uh, in the in the lecture notes, I will also provide some links related to scholarly writing, which will be useful for you. Uh, and hopefully, I get to see some of your research published someday, and maybe even uh, in the Spaffa Journal. Uh, so with that, uh, good luck and good writing. <laughs>